Okay, so now we're getting into the diversity of plants. We're going to start at kind of the most primitive form of plants, and that are that is the bryophytes. So when we look at the phylogeny of our modern day plants, we talked last time about carophytes, which are an algal um, relative of a common descendant of plants. Um, at least evidence points to that. Um, and then we have the bryophytes, which do not have vasculature. They do not have xylem and phloem. So they're relatively short, right? They can't really grow really high. Um, so we'll start with bryophytes, and then we'll get into our first uh, vascular plants, which are the ferns and relatives, and then we'll get into the seeded plants, the gymnosperms, and finally the angiosperms, which are flowering plants. So um, the bryophytes um, and all plants after colonizing land developed a few different things to prevent being drying, uh, dried out in the sun or to prevent desiccation. So first is the waxy cuticle over leaves and over other parts of the plant, which is a layer of wax or a fatty substance um, which keeps water in and <clears throat> also um, when you feel a plant, you can feel that it has this kind of thick layer um, and water will run over it as well. They also have a multicellular uh, gametangia, um, which is a place for holding gametes and a sporangia for holding spores so that they can um, develop those gametes and spores within an area um, not exposed to the air, not exposed to evaporation. And then the zygotes develop in multicellular embryos with parental tissues that originally surrounded the egg. So you have um, an seed is an example of this where you have the embryo with the zygote um, and that encapsulates it and keeps it from drying out and also provides it nourishment. So bryophytes, there's about 23,000 species and includes mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. We're going to um, talk about each, but we'll go over the life cycle of mosses. They occupy a wide range of habitats, including damp banks, trees, and logs. They are dependent on moisture, so they can't really live in arid environments very well. But if there is uh, some amount of moisture they will be able to survive. So they, they are found in extreme environments such as frozen alpine slopes and in all elevations from sea level up to 5,500 meters or more. So that's really high in elevation. <clears throat> they do not have um, roots. Instead, they have what is called rhizoids. Okay, And they are generally associated with mycorrhizal fungi, just like in other plant roots. They do not have a true xylem or phloem, but some of them have hydroids, which is a structure for conducting water. Um, most of them, however, just will absorb water directly through the surface. Okay, so here's an example of a hydroid here. Um, they also, some of them have leptoids for food conduction. So similar to xylem and phloem, but just not as structurally um, sound. Um, and then external water is necessary for sexual reproduction so this is another reason why they can't really um, persist in arid environments so uh, in mosses oh, there we go the leafy plant is the major part of the gametophyte gener generation the gametophyte is the part of the generation that produces gametes. So they have an alternation of generation, generation similar to other plants. Um, the sporophyte generation grows from the gametophyte and the sporophyte produces the spores. The gametophyte produces the gametes. Um, and there's three distinct bryophyte phyla, mosses, liver, hornworts, um, sorry, liverworts, mosses, and hornworts. And this is one hypothesis of maybe how they evolved, but they may have evolved th independently three different times from these uh, green algae. So we're going to start with hepatophyta, <laughs> or the liverworts. Um, and they, their structure is they have this flattened 
lobed thalli or singular it's a thallus okay and 20% of liverworts are thalloid some of the 20 80% are leafy um, these thalli or leafy gametophytes develop from spores and when they germinate they produce this structure called a protonoma okay and protonoma is an immature gametophyte consisting of very short filaments and in thalloid liverworts growth is prostate and prostrate in one cell rhizoids on the lower surface anchor the plant so they don't have much of a root system you can see it's kind of attaching to the rock here um, just being anchored right there and they grow just along the ground they don't grow vertically um, and they're kind of peculiar in structure so here's a life cycle of one of them but we aren't going to go over that all right so thalloid liverworts the best known species is called uh, are in the genus marchantia um, and the thallus forks so you see all these bro um, branches of the thallus dichotomously as it grows and each branch has a notch at the apex and a central groove okay so a notch and central groove down the middle and its meristemic cells in the notch continue to divide to divide so it continues to grow that way the bottom layer of the thallus is the epidermis and that's where the rhizoids and scales arise all right so the upper surface of marchantia is divided into diamond shaped segments that mark the limit of the chambers below so you see this the diamond shaped segment so this is kind of cut in half and looking into it each segment has this pore which opens into the chamber so allowing for gas exchange and then it has these short rows of um, cells with chloroplasts in them okay and that's where photosynthesis then takes place all right so um the leafy liverworts have two rows of partially overlapping leaves so you can see them how they're overlapping partially there um, there's no midrib they often have folds or lobes and they contain oil bodies where they secrete oils the third row of under leaves is also often present and the archegonia and antheridia produce these cup-like structures okay um, composed of modified leaves ax and in the axles of the leaves or on separate branches okay so here's one right here there's the female gametophyte and the male gametophyte and the sporophyte pushes out from among the leaves okay so underneath here are the leaves and these push out vertically from there all right anthosoro Anth Anthocerophyta are the hornworts, um, and they have a mature sporophyte that looks like a miniature greenish black rod. Um, and the gametophytes are thalloid, just like in the liverworts, and they have cells with only one large chloroplast. The thalli have pores and cavities, so similar to the um, liverworts, and often contain. A symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria. It's only about 100 species and they asexually reproduce by fragmentation. Okay, so here are the um, sporophytes, just look like rods, not much to them. Here's a hornwort as well. All right, so the most diverse is the phylum bryophyta or the mosses. And they have about 15,000 species currently known and divided into three classes, peat mosses, true mosses, and rock mosses, okay? And so these are generally found in forests on the forest floor. We can see lots of them, or maybe on rocks. When you find your rock mosses, peat mosses create these dense, thick layers, similar. Um, they kind of look like grass on top, but not as, um, you know from a distance but they don't extend vertically as much as grasses do 
All right, so the leaves of the mosque aminophytes have blades. Nearly always one cell thick, except at the midrib, and they are never lobed or divided. The cells usually contain numerous chloroplasts. You can see that here. These cells have lots of chloroplasts. Peat mosses have large transparent cells without chloroplasts that absorb water and small green photosynthetic san cells sandwiched between them. So that's what we have Oops, here. So you have these cells that absorb water and then the chloroplast, the cells with chloroplasts between them. Um, the axis is stem-like, does not have a xylem or phloem, and they often have these hydroids in their uh, stem-like structures. All right, they can reproduce asexually. They do it through uh, gametangia at the apices uh, or the tops, the apical uh, leaf shoots. Okay, so here's a gametangia here. This is the archegonium, which produces the egg. Um, and then, which is above this swollen base, and then it has this kind of tube structure for a um, sperm cell to enter in. They also have multicellular filament, filaments called paraphyses um, scattered among the archegonia. Okay, so here's these paraphyses, um, or one of the paraphyses, and they are then surrounding and protecting the archegonium. Okay, the males, uh, or the male structure forms um, antheridia, which is on a very, very short stalk here. Okay, swollen antheridia fills with sperm. Um, the sperm cells each have a pair of fl flagella and then they are forced out of the top of the antheridium. And then I also have these paraphyses scattered among them. So what happens is in sexual reproduction, the archegonia release the substance to attract the sperm. The sperm swim down the neck of the archegonium and it fertilizes the egg to form a zygote which grows into a spindle-shaped embryo, okay? The top of the archegonium splits off and forms a cap on top of the sporophyte called a calyptra. And then the mature sporophyte consists of a capsule, ceta, and foot. So the foot is the anchoring part, the ceta is like the stalk, and the capsule is the top which has all the spores in it. Meiosis then produces spores inside the capsule, and then the peristome, which is kind of the top of the capsule has one or two rows of teeth under the operculum at the tip of the capsule and then that opens up or closes in response to humidity if it's nice and humid it will release spores and then they will develop into filamentous protonoma that then produce buds that develop into our gametophytes okay and so this is what it looks like. So we'll go over this in class. You have the protonomas establishing, they produce male gametophytes and female gametophytes. The male gametophytes have the antheridiums on them, which produce sperm. The females have the archegonium on them, which produce eggs and have these long necks. This, they produce the attractant for the sperm. It goes down and fertilizes the egg and now it becomes a zygote. That zygote develops into a sporophyte. Okay, so this is all a diploid structure, but it's still sitting on top of the gametophyte. Um, the sporophyte, um, the cells within the sporophyte then go through meiosis to create haploid um, spores. Um, they'll gather in uh, the structure on top of the ceta um, and then the little teeth like structures will open up the calyptal, calyptal cap will fall off the perculum will open and then the spores will go out and create protonoma okay so there's the full life cycle all right, so bryophytes are really important for humans. They're a pioneer species, okay? So 
They're the only really species that can grow on bare rock and as they continue to do that over and over and die and then redevelop they'll create a layer of vegetation which will form um, soil. So important for the formation of soil so other things can grow on top of it. Top of it. They're able to accumulate minerals, you know, leach things out of the rocks, which are important for um, growth and can be used by, utilized by other organisms. They help retain moisture, reduce flooding and erosion, especially on, you know, banks of rivers. They're indicators of surface water, so they can't reproduce without water. So if there is mosses there, then you know that there is water accumulating on the surface there somehow. They can... They're very squishy, so they can be used as a packing material. And peat mosses um, have been used for thousands of years for multiple uses. They are a soil conditioner, so they can be mixed in with the soil because um, they're very absorptive. Um, they can also be used for medicinal properties. They have an antiseptic properties and absorbencies to them. And finally, peat moss can also be dried out and then burnt and used as fuel, similar to wood. But it has to be dried out first.